when I'm always asked what your favorite movie was, I said there's nothing like the first. Dazed is always the beginning, the, the, the diving board. You know, that experience, I think, spoiled us. That, that passion, you know, sort of er, you know, early on in, in one's career. It's the, it's like, it's, it's the starting point. It's a total starting point. As you look back on your past, you look back on something, you think about it, and it kind of becomes metaphorical, it means something else. If you're lucky, you get that shot in life. And I think Dazed, in a way, was my shot. It was his second movie, it was his first big movie. It was all these kids' first movie. I mean, there was a lot of hopes and aspirations riding on this. There were so many people in that movie who were not famous, who are famous now. See me in that movie, you don't think that guy, he's going far. <laughs> Woo! Y'all ready to bust some ass? <laughs> Dazed was this weird marriage of studio and independent. It wasn't always smiles and it wasn't always harmonious. Okay, we didn't get the corporate love, you know, but how could we ever have imagined we could have? But what we did get was a film that we all put our hearts into and that this was, you know, what we did that summer. In 1991, a film of mine, Slacker, came out and became kind of an independent success of, of that year. A little $23,000 film from nowhere, shot on 16 millimeter, kind of becomes a minor cult film. Rick had this idea to do an American graffiti for the 70s. I just found myself in this great position of like, have kind of cool idea that they might take and studio kind of interested. It was that one little window you're occasionally given in this lifetime where things, you know, hook up. And I said, we'd like to fly you out to L.A. and talk about this American graffiti idea you have. But suddenly I'm flying to L.A. first class. I hadn't done that before. I didn't even know how to put the seat, the uh, tray up for your, you know, breakfast or whatever. I mean, he was completely savvy and hugely cool and sophisticated. And he was a kid at a drive-in, all in the same person. I'd had a little lunch with Jim right before. And he was talking about, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing your pitch, pitch. He kept hearing, saying the word pitch. And I'm like, am I supposed to do something like pitch? What is that? I remember just thinking like, this is that moment where your whole life hangs in a balance. So I remember just, just talking. I didn't like jump up on the desk, like something out of the player where you go first shot close up of, I just started talking about the movie and the characters and the tone of it. I always saw the movie as we're dropping in on May 28, 1976. It's the last day of school. We get to know all these people, both high school people and junior high people going into high school. And we spend one evening with them and what you know happens in this one evening is what the story is. And there's, there's no one huge dramatic arch, but there's a lot of little ones. Come on, let's go. Oh, let's go, come on. Oh shit! Damn, oh, yeah, lady! Ducks on the pond! How you doing, boys? One of the few kind of through line plot points in the whole movie is these uh, the fear of these hazing initiation rituals. That, you know, the boys would get paddled and the women would just get stuff dumped all over them. Welcome to high school, honey. It's nothing as grandiose as going off to the war or not, or moving to another. You know, the older kids are juniors, so they're back the next year. It's not whether to go to college or not. The stakes are low, but it's your life, so the stakes are actually pretty high. It's what we've been working for all of our lives, man. Me and you, Benny, we're gonna be champions together. Look, man, all I'm saying is that if I do play next year, it's gonna be on my terms, not theirs. I didn't want it to be this fond look at, oh, what a great era. If we can only return to that time, like this was a shitty time, you know, it was a, it's always a crummy time. If you're a teenager, it's just a, it's tough no matter when and where, it's always gonna be difficult. So we made a deal, you know, to do it. And, uh, and we started talking about the script. Wow, there's some old script pages. 
in the margin Cynthia's line. When it's all over, no one remembers who won or lost. All the best lines in days were kind of in the, in the margins. We worked quite a while. We worked five or six months on this script. Then it got to be this point that we were going to make the movie. Of course, at that point, we got into that whole situation with Universal about whether they really wanted to make the movie or not. And they didn't think it was funny enough. And, you know, we were going to get an R rating for language, but there wasn't any naked girls or anything like that in it. It was R rated not for anything gratuitous, not for anything even obvious, just because life was R rated. I mean, Jim and Sean did a good job of kind of forcing this film into production. That's what, what they did very effectively even threatening to take it to another studio if it didn't, if Universal didn't do it. It was the only movie where we ever actually had to pull out our deal and say, listen, it's under a certain budget. We have the right to make it. Trust us. So I met some, some casting directors and they, they all seemed kind of fun. And then one day in steps, this guy, Don Phillips. And I'll never forget, I, I met Rick and Ann at the commissary, and I just was so enthusiastic about working with this guy, and I just <laughs> loved him. John Phillips was this kind of crazed, fanatical believer in the movie and in the kids that he was bringing in. This guy's kind of crazy, but I like his energy. You know, I like his kind of, he loved people, he loved kind of mixing it up, had a lot of things to say, he was funny and passionate. Those times, in the business where there is a crop, <laughs> a beautiful crop of flowers that it's just amazing how many people at that time show up at the same time. And we had oh. our choices at, at that particular at, time. At that point, teen, teen films were out. out. There, that, that ebbs and flows and it was right. at a low point right then. And there were no real teen stars. I mean, if we were to do Days Today, it would be just saturated with WB kind of TV actors exactly. getting their first movie and exactly. things like that. We couldn't have gone with the non-names. Hey, you. Come here. Who are you? Uh, nobody. A lot of the people in Days were people we just kind of plucked out of obscurity here in Austin. When I got the part at school, I got handed a flyer. I was getting, coming out of a coffee shop, just kind of wandering aimlessly down the dragon. Uh, and just kind of walked up to me. Oh, would you like to be in a movie? Sure. Oh, yeah, Mitch Kramer? Mitchie, 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 Mitchie. <laughs> We're looking for you, pal. Do you want to be a movie star? I don't know. It's scary. It's really scary. What's going to happen? That's a silly question. I don't know. That's why it's so weird. I don't have the slightest idea what's going to happen. I remember very clearly like meeting everyone in the cast like the first time I met them. The first time they walk in the door. My first impressions. My name is Anthony Rapp. Hi, Adam Goldberg. Marissa Ravisi. Hi. <laughs> nice try, freshman. Just for being so brave, I'll tell you what, I'm only going to give you five licks, okay? The movie was coming alive during the casting. I mean, I love the way these things work out, and, and the film was totally open for this, but there's Don sitting in a bar later at night. I guess he had let the bartender know what he was doing in town. And he found out that I had cast Fast Times at Ridgemont High. A few minutes later, he's sitting there having a conversation with Matthew McConaughey, a film student, you know, who's a junior in college, who just goes over and starts talking to him. And we did not talk at all about movies. We didn't talk about anything but golf and girls yeah. and, and booze. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we just had ourselves a good old boys kind of time. And all of a sudden, it just hit me. I went, hey. I said, there's this little part. I remember even going like this to you. I said, there's this little part called Waterson. And you said, you ever done any acting? Yeah. I was like, I was in a Miller Lite commercial. <laughs> <laughs> you know Wooderson? Oh. How's it going, man? Hey. Pretty good. How's it going with you? Say, man, you got a joint? Uh, no, not on me, man. <laughs> It'd be a lot cooler if you did. <laughs> After the final casting, I just wanted to be prepping all the actors for the vibe. I mean, they were little kids. They probably had no, not much of a specific memory of the 70s. 
So I wanted to get them into the into the vibe of it. I remember making these mixtapes. Yeah, I'll never forget. Rick started sending before the actors even came. He'd make these little discs, these little CDs music, of all right. the music, Set, the cassette, huh? cassette. Cassette. He sent us a, a package of how he expected us to be and what he wanted. And I thought it was the perfect thing. I think every director should do that because he really told each person what he needed and wanted from them. I came there just knowing. I got this letter from Rick before the movie started. He said, if the movie, um, if the finished product of the movie is as written, it will be a massive underachievement. It was my invitation to the party. And I sent him that before because I wanted him to come arrive in Austin with this stuff in their head. I see Pink growing up being somebody who doesn't pro probably doesn't make a lot of money. He probably fears his old man. <laughs> what does Jody hate? Violence. He just thinks about smoking marijuana. They actually knew what beat that, was, that they had to take, you know, and, and, and the old conductor over here had given them the mm -hmm. right, right beats. Listen, I give them, like, who they're listening yeah, to. Right. Like, yeah. Their taste, yeah, you know? Right. Listen, you're a Ted She's Nugent man, and <laughs> ZZ Top, you know, Southern <laughs> rock with a little heavy metal, you know? That's where I found my walk. <laughs> what walk? You know that walk. Mm -hmm. It ain't chin forward, it ain't heart forward. <laughs> this is forward. <laughs> <laughs> You have to empower the actors to be themselves, and I think that's what a director does. He sets up an atmosphere where they can do their best work, and in this case, I just needed them to be themselves and bring their own kind of vibe to their, their character in the movie. never forget the first time Parker Posey walked in. It totally changed my conception of who Darla could be. At first I thought Darla would be this kind of tough, broad, really kind of mean, you know, that was just my one dimensional idea. But that my ideas mixed with Parker took it to some level I could never have imagined. Like she brought this kind of sheer joy to being a bitch. I've been through a lot of stuff in high school and I'm just bad, and you know, I deserve to be torture queen and just have fun. Oh, you didn't hear it, did you? No. What? No, you didn't hear I got a shotgun pulled on my ass? No, no way. I swear to God. No. I mean, I always imagined the female and male nemesis in this movie. O'Banion, Ben Affleck, and Darla Parker Posey. I mean, they're, they're bad people. They're doing bad things to younger kids. They're assholes. But, you know, in both of those characters, I thought there was a charm and wit, both in Ben and Parker, that would kind of rise above. I mean, I was definitely the, the, the most unappealing <laughs> character in a movie full of appealing people. He's like a classic bad guy who has a certain debonair, you know, oh, some ruffians about, you know, he would kind of put a little mm on it. And you, get the hell off my property. Oh, well, I'm sorry, ma'am. I was just uh, escorting your fine young son home from school. There's. There were some ruffians about, and I... Oh, and uh, Mitch, Carl, we'll be seeing each other again. So everybody keeps patting you on the back your whole life. It seems like that's what you have to do, you know? What if I don't want to do that? The way the script is structured, it kind of centers on Pink. He's sort of the through guy, which is a really tough part. You know, I've said it before, I don't think Jason gets enough credit for holding the whole movie together. And he's not the guy with all the, the jazz, all the business, but... If you don't care about him, if you don't have a feel for him, you really got nothing. You know, Coach, I got to get going. Me and my loser friends, you know, we got to go get Aerosmith tickets. Top priority of the summer. Oh, uh, Coach, uh, I forgot. I might play ball. But I will never sign that. Maybe Pink doesn't stand out as the funny guy, but people love Randall Pink Floyd too, you know, in, a, in that way of like, they want to be my buddy. They don't want to go get stoned with me. They want to be my, fr my, my friend, you know. And uh, with Rory, I'm sure the guys had so many people want to get just high as a kite with him or whatever since then, you know. Wait, wait, wait. I got a 
Who's buying this afternoon for my own business, if you know what I'm talking about, so. That's what you're talking about. That's what I'm talking about, man. I remember people in the 70s always saying that. No matter what you said, they're like, that's what I'm talking about. They just say anything, and they go, that's what I'm talking about. Or you get a beer, that's what I'm talking about. It was just this weird thing everyone was always saying. And so I was thinking, I gotta get a character to say that more. Like, maybe get, just, I wanna permeate the film with that a little more. My first conversation with Rory, he's like two minutes off the plane practically. And he's like, hey, Rick, I was thinking for my character, no matter what anybody says, I'm gonna say, that's what I'm talking about. I was just like, okay, we're off and running here. And she, she was real cool too. She'd harvest the crops, man. That's what I'm talking about. She'd put in the, in the um, bushels and stuff and sell it, you know, because they had to, you know, make ends meet and stuff. I mean, they, they, what, did you ever look at a dollar bill, man? There's some spooky stuff going on on a dollar bill, man. Yeah. I mean, and it's green too. Days Confused was the first time ever that I had experienced the kind of collaboration that we had on that film. Anthony was a professional at that point. He had been in theater, he had been in other movies, he was a little more experienced than the rest. He was very confident as a, as a performer. Like, he was one of the only ones who came and, like, knew all his lines. And I was like, you don't need to know all your lines, man. They were going to change those anyway. Rick would sit down with us at rehearsal. We'd read through the scene, and then he'd say, what do you think? Usually the actor is like the last person on the totem pole in a way in a film. No, Certainly not the first to for the writer director to say, "What do you think?" D done a play in college, a, Bre a Brecht play, and one of the lines was, "Wipe that face off your head." But it was just a bad translation from like a. I mean, that's what it translated into from German. I was like, "Can I say that?" He's like, "Sure." All right, let's what are you looking at? Wipe that face off your head, bitch. That was so cool that he was so open to little things that, that everyone was adding. He was interested in the instincts of the actors. Even some of these kids were really young and this was their first movie. Now, there's part of a producer which goes, wait a second, you're listening? Who are you listening to? What are you changing things around for? <laughs> I remember every day at lunch, I would have often a little huddle up with if Jim Jacks was around and would go through what work remained in the day. But every day it was like, okay, so we have to drop this, this, this. Like, how can we hang on to the story but not shoot all this other stuff you have in mind? The problem is, is we didn't have a lot of rehearsal time before we started the movie. So he was doing that every morning, every day on the set and it would eat up a huge amount of the shoot day. And we would often get to lunch and not have one setup. There was so much to be done and so little time. I really needed about 42 to 45 days to make the film and okay, you can have 36. You know, everything I needed, I got about 80% of. Everybody hear that? No high five. Yeah, sure. What about low five? Yeah, low five. After the Little League game where they're all telling each other, good game, good game, good game. It's just this little bit that every kid who ever played Little League ball did. And it, I always thought it was funny, and, and I just always had it in my head. I had to shoot this, but at, at lunch that day, it's like, well, we don't need that. It really got, you know, sometimes to the point that I just said, well, then we're gonna have to cut this scene. He said, well, we can't cut this scene. No, to me, that's what the scene's all about. It doesn't make sense on the page, but that's, to me, the essence of that scene. I said, well, I agree with that, but then you've got to shoot faster because we don't have the extra day. He said, well, you got to get me the extra day. I said, I can't. I got you the movie. And so my script supervisor could say, oh, but if we don't get that, it won't cut. It won't cut with this. And so like, oh, okay, I guess we can film it. It wasn't enough for me to say, I want it, because it's my movie and that's how I see it. That wasn't to be trusted. If I worked and got as stressed out on every movie the way I did on Days Confused, I'd have a heart I would have had a heart attack years ago. <laughs> I'd like to dedicate this hey, first lick to Big. That's okay. Okay. I would like to dedicate this first lick to your mother. I'm going up to Ben Affleck and saying, you know, well, what are we going to call, like, Carl Burns' mom? I mean, it's like, bitch, but is that enough? Yeah. So we did a series of takes, and we, let's do one. Let's, I was just starting to amp him up more. And it got to where he said, you know, this little cocksucker's mom. And it, it sounded good coming out of Ben's mouth. Did y'all hear this little motherfucker's mom pulled a shotgun on me this afternoon? Fucking bitch. We went and saw dailies, and it was the scene where they pour paint over Ben's head. Oh. Oh. Cut. 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 And just 
Two days before I had talked to Ben, I said, can you please tone down the language? And he said, I he would. I don't like it. Jim's talking to you? When, when at the hotel? Where is he telling you not to cuss? You know, who is the, my co-director, my invisible co-director going behind my back telling the actors not to cuss? I go on the set. Now, Ben's a big guy. I grab Ben, I push him against a pole. I said, don't you fucking listen. And he's like, well, you can't say cocksucker. You can't say cocksucker. And he goes like, and he goes like, what are you talking about? I said, I just watched Dailies and you're using cocksucker this, cocksucker that. I said, well, talk to Rick. I mean, you know, this is what we're talking about. And I, and I was like, and I, for me, I think it's, you know, I think it's good. He's like, I can't believe you would do that. I'm like, what are you talking about? You used the word cocksucker. I said, so? I mean, it's like, that's worse than fuck. I'm like, it is? Fuck? I thought fuck was the worst word, not cocksucker. He said, no, cocksucker's much worse. You can't. You know, he's just, ah. I had the power on the set, not Rick. It was our movie. Now, it was his vision, and we were there to help him. But if we really had a problem with it, Rick would have been gone. I knew he was a wrestler, kind of burly, you know, wrestler guy, but I was quick, you know, I had him on speed, so I was already planning. Like, if, if he makes a move to me, I'm gonna back up and start jabbing. I was ready for him that way, because if he could, could get his bear hug around me and a wrestler, I would be doomed, so I was ready to do my float like a butterfly and just start. I was ready, I was ready. It didn't get to that. Jim calls me from his cell phone on the street in Austin and says, I just slammed my fist into a phone pole. My knuckles are bleeding. I blew open one knuckle and I still have the scar on it. And I remember I said, Jim, it's better than hitting Rick. I felt the way Mitch was being initiated by this brutal force, that was me making the movie being initiated into like how you get a film made with someone else's money, you know, at a studio level. I, I felt I was being, you know, the one paddled and kind of running for my life, but yet trying to fit in, you know, somewhat and get along. My two week assessment, basically on time. This is two weeks in the production, shit. I'm making responsible choice. I'm like sticking up for myself because I'm under such attack. I don't think we ever really doubted Rick. I may have certainly made him feel that way sometimes. This is a memo to Jim, I guess. <laughs> Whether this is an okay movie or a great movie, your job is to enable me room to make a great movie. Two weeks in, I'm making a compromised piece of shit, followed by an incredible cinematic underachievement. Nobody likes to be pushed, but sometimes that makes you better. You know. Looking back, I'm much more grateful for that opportunity than I was at the time. I was just kind of, you know, I thought I should have had more of everything. But I was lucky I had what I had at all, you know. It takes a lot to step back and go, I'm just lucky. Now when I make a film, every day I kind of tell myself, I'm just lucky I'm getting to do this. I was, I was grounded at the Crest Hotel last night. <laughs> I was. I, I was sent to my room. Because we were riding the, uh, the service elevator, and the uh, security fascist uh, comes up to me, and, you know, and he goes, OK, that's it. You're out of here. You're out of here. You're going to be evicted. I said, you can't evict me. I was riding in the service elevator. He comes right up to my face, and he says, uh, he goes, don't you tell me what I can or cannot do. Do you understand me? I run this hotel. You're just a punk. We just went insane and just, just wrought havoc on that hotel. Yes, I really needed to buy this. I really needed a turtle ashtray. I had to have it. I have I so, much, so stuff much stuff to take here. back to LA. It's horrible. I bought this shirt for 75 cents. Did yeah. you? Yes. Get back. I bought these pants for $2. My whole outfit is 50 cents. <laughs> I was aware while I was in my world of production that they were all having a great time. I think they had a fun summer camp. But I, I would hear stories like, oh, we floated down the river yesterday, or we did you know, on their days off. And I could get a sense they were having a good time, which was great. I was glad someone was having a good time. We're going to smoke our morning crack right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I've made some great friends. Yeah, me too. So, I had no yeah. friends in LA. Yeah, I don't <laughs> have any friends either. Me and Joey are friends. I had, I had one best friend, friend in LA, and now I have, I have a few. So. Yeah, Parker and Joey, you know, had bonded so much personally that they were like, well, where's our scene? What's what's up? And I'm like, you know, you're together at all these things, but yeah, you're right. And they said, well, we're going to write a scene. So we wanted to do a scene, and we wanted to do a scene that, that wasn't about boys or nail polish or, you know, the things that, that men Or serious think. bonding. We wanted, like, a hangout, really natural Conversation, scene. like girls you know, really have conversations, believe it or not. <laughs> and they, they came back with, oh, we got a scene. And I'm like, okay, we're gonna shoot that scene. 
You know, we just kind of went over it. I didn't, you know, it was their scene. And that drives the production crazy. It's like, what do you, a scene that's not even in the script? We're going to spend time shooting. So we had to kind of sneak it into the production. Last weekend, she went roller skating with that group she's in. <laughs> Parents without plans. <laughs> Parents without partners. <laughs> Parents, Parents without, without plans. plans. <laughs> And it was in the movie for the longest time. It survived many cuts. But the movie, because it had this sort of loose style, it was too long to begin with. So I had like a two hour and 45 minute, like, first cut. We yeah. hope that makes it. We yeah. hope it makes it, yeah. Oh, it was painful. It was really painful to drop that scene from the movie. Hey, man, 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 so we concentrate now, concentrate up there. So they asked me if I'd ever played baseball before. I'm like, yeah, sure, yeah, totally. Never, like, so never touched a baseball in my entire life. Yeah, I thought, how bad could it be? You know, like, every American boy has played baseball at some point, you know? So Ricky, like, kind of tried in vain to, like, throw a ball at me a couple of times, and, you know, it's, like, hitting me in the head and stuff. I would throw the ball here, catch, and he couldn't catch it from three feet away. He would, like, put out his glove, and he would, like, okay, well, he has no reference here, none. So when we get out there, they have to use a stunt double for the, the behind shot where I actually throw. And Rick's like, okay, all you have to do is just do the wind up and, you know, look like you mean it. Look like you know what you're doing and everything will be cool. So I'm like concentrating really hard on trying to not come off as a total idiot. So don't worry. This is going to be a humiliating evening in a way, but it, I assure you at the end, you're going to look like Roger Clemens. So I'm throwing and the ball's just like flying off in these like crazy directions. And um, there's this whole little league team of extras that are all just brutally mocking me. I was like, hey, Wiley, it's on the look. Just, I need your eyes. I need you to look like you're a killer, you know? <laughs> Sports, focus. Just give me that. If you give me that, we'll be fine. That's the thing I'm most proud of on that movie. I, like, I don't know if I can act my way out of a paper bag, but like, I managed to keep a straight face and not start crying for the scene when all the little league kids were making fun of me. <laughs> I told Rick, and, and you know, if God had meant me to play baseball, he would have given me a glove. That's all I got to say. I sucked out there. So you're a freshman, right? Yeah. Well, so tell me, man, how's this year's crop of freshman chicks looking? <laughs> what, you're gonna end up in jail sometime early summer? I know that. But. No, man. Yeah. No, I'll tell you. Yeah. That's what I love about these high school girls, man. I get older. They stay the same age. They just <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> I could tell the crew was like laughing and there were little looks and you know when Matthew showed up, there was something special was definitely going on. You know, Matthew as Witterson was just it was the coolest. Witterson really only had a couple lines and a couple scenes. It really was a small part. I just think what he did with that part, people don't know. You know, on on page on the paper it wasn't much of anything. And things got rewritten and things got staged around him. And it was the night where you drive to the Chevelle through the top notch, top notch and things are starting to happen in town, you know? And you didn't really have any lines that night. We, we filmed you driving and it was like, well, let's, you know, let's come up with some stuff mm -hmm. here. All right, all right, all right. Oh, Christ. How you doing? Pretty good. Cool. And we did that all spontaneously that night. I remember I was like, out. it was like, we got to get some information delivered. Because yep. it's like, you know, as you have this big ensemble, you look at the script and it's like, oh, how did the, how did the nerds in the car, Tony, Mike, Cynthia, know about the beer bust at all? You heard about the party being busted, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not to worry. There's a new fiesta in the making as we speak. It's out at the Moon Tower. Full kegs. Everybody's going to be there. You ought to go. Okay. Okay, we'll be there. Okay. So the only thing we have to do, you have to give them information, but while we're doing that... How and why and What can we do with on? that, yeah. you know? And Rick goes, okay, so Wooderson, you know, has been with the, you know, all the the girls in the high school that he wanted to be, and he's been with the good-looking brunette, the good-looking blonde, everything. <laughs> he's after the red-headed intellectual. Yeah. When we did the scene, 
you see it in the scene. We're like locked eyes and like, we're right there and no one else knew what we talked about or what was going on. It was a really sort of special scene. Say you need a ride? Uh, no, I got my own car, thanks. Yeah, well listen, you ought to ditch the two geeks you're in the car with now and get in with us, but that's all right, we'll worry about that later. I will see you there, all right? God, I love those redheads, man. The part's getting bigger. It started rocking and rolling. It, it was just like this unfolding, expanding character. Matthew's father died in, in the middle of shooting, and he went back for, this, for the funeral, and I think it was your mom who said your dad would have liked you to come back and go back to mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. So Rick said, I'll never forget as long as that Rick said, when he comes back, I got a few more things for him to do. <laughs> <laughs> and and he came back and it ended all the way and, to the very end. Well, of one of them was the scene on the football field. I felt right. that the movie was buildings in some kind of apex, but it wasn't in the script. Like, well, what happens on the football field? They talk shit, but that's not what the movie's really about. What's what's the core? What can you like tell Pink or, you mm -hmm. know, like if it's his kind of what's going on in his mind that night? Man, it's the same bullshit they tried to pull in my day. You know, if it ain't that piece of paper, some other choice we're gonna try and make for you. You gotta do what Randall Pink Floyd wants to do, man. And let me tell you this, the older you do get, the more rules are gonna try to get you to follow. <laughs> you just gotta keep living, man. L-I-V-I-N. <laughs> you know, I think that's just a great well, moment on the field when you yeah. sort of empower him, but you know, you sort of. I didn't know this, but Matthew just said it about an hour ago. What, what inspired that line, Rick, was. Oh, yeah. It was his father. Mm -hmm. You know, just keep on. He's up there, but he's just keeping on living. It's a verb. <laughs> yeah, right. This is my final shot of the film. I can't yeah. believe it. It's over. How do you feel? I feel, I feel safe, but fulfilled. Going back after a production like this, you just go back to your life, whatever it was. Some kids are going back to high school, you know, and like Wiley and Kristen's, you know, their situations. Other kids are, you know, Matthew goes back and finishes senior year of college. You know, other actors are going back looking for work. It's gonna be weird to not be able to like get up and go to the lobby and see your friends or call your friend and they'll be here in two seconds. No. Don't do that, don't. No, no. I oh, know, you have to keep your hair just like that. That's just the like only way go home with it like this. Work finished for Ben. I appreciate it. Everything. I'm gonna sit down. I was like protective, like a parent would be, like, I hope the world is nice to them, you know, I hope things work out, and you know it, it can't in all cases, and, but, so you just sort of, but you kind of love them all equally. I was shooting last night until, geez, I guess like maybe one or two, I don't really remember. And Thursday's my last day. Saturday was officially my last day, but we're doing pickups right now. And I'm gonna have to, to, to go to school and then like work and, and I don't know how this is all gonna work out. It's like summer camp, you know? You go and you say, oh, I'm gonna call you, I'm gonna write you. And you never do. I wish, I wish I could, but. It's the best summer I've ever had in my entire life, and it's over. Say goodbye to Nick, he's leaving. No, are you done? I'm done. He and I were, were, um, you know, in the hotel lobby, and we're talking about it, and we were saying, yeah, man, you know, yeah, well, never, I'm never, never gonna do another episode of television again, you know, and that's pretty much all I had done was, you know, um, that's how I, you know, had started to kind of make my living as an actor at the time, you know, I was like, you know, we're never gonna do another fucking sitcom, and, you know, we're never gonna do another, another fucking TV show, and blah, 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 and I don't think it was more than three weeks later where he and I bumped into each other at an audition for a sitcom, and we were, like, both, like, dressed up for the part, you know, and, uh, you know, we just sort of spied each other, and we were like, mm -hmm. Hey. Let's do it. So that's that, huh? Okay. I remember watching that, um, you know, two-hour and 20-minute assembly cut that Sandra, my editor, had just kind of put together independently of me. And, um, 
just looking at it and we have a meeting after I was just sitting there going okay so what do most directors feel at this moment when they watch it and Sandra just put a gun to her head and went I said okay good so we've got a lot of work to do I was in Pasadena one day and somebody said was handing out one of those tickets to the those like uh, you know uh, free screenings which is which is I now realize was like a test screening I had never gone through this before but the torturous test screenings where they this is the Hollywood invented this, I think, where you show it to an impartial audience, recruited audience, and uh, they just watch the movie and fill out cards after, and 20 people stay and answer questions like, what didn't you understand? And so this guy said, do you want to see this movie? And I said, well, what is it? And, he, and the guy literally was like, um, you know, it's like, it's this movie about, and I said, well, who's in it? And he was like, nobody. I said, what is it? He's like, I can't, we can't get anybody to go see this movie. It's some dumb movie about like, you know, kids having sex in the back of cars or whatever. And I thought like, I said, well, what, what's it called? And he's dazed and confused. And I was like, wow. The fact is that the distributor did not get behind it in the way that would have sold a whole lot of tickets. That's the studio's job is to infuse an enthusiasm, you know, all the way down the line that permeates the process. We did not win the battle of getting dazed the wide, wide release it should have had. There, were, there was an audience for this movie in every city. You know, you go through all that in a studio level, and then you get an independent film release, basically. It felt like, you know, why? I remember even writing a letter to the cast. I was like, you know, they kind of never got behind the film. It's not going to be some huge hit. But, you know, the film will live in some form or fashion and we should all feel good about what we did. Went off and did a movie, T Time to Kill, which was all of a sudden sort of overnight from Friday to Monday, became a movie star, uh, sort of, you know, celebrity overnight, a movie star kind of thing. That was a big change, a big hinge as far as the way life went. From anonymity like? on Friday to walking around being an, an observer and uh, to Monday being the one observed. After I did days, I did a lot of I did like a whole series of off-Broadway plays. After Days and Confused, I made Good Will Hunting. I made Chasing Amy. Amistad, Contact. Before Sunrise. Tracy Ullman. Twister. Rage, Carrie 2. Rent. My Two Dads. How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. 13 Conversations. Suburbia. Saving Private Ryan. <gasps> Lady for Guffman. Shakespeare in Love. Safe Passage with Susan Sarandon. Waking Life. Waking Life. I Bought My Mother a House. Beautiful Mind. A Beautiful Mind. School of Rock. I got engaged briefly. They say, have you ever seen that movie, Days and Confused? <laughs> yeah. You just look just like her, that girl in it. I mean, I was particularly concerned about, um, you know, Kristen and Wiley, two young high school kids that, you know, this was, they were really just pulled out of obscurity to be in this movie. I felt protective, too, and kind of, you know, what can I do to help? You know, I didn't want to screw up your life you know I was very conscious of this could be a negative I've been pinching myself since ever this since ever since this started it's the weirdest summer I've ever had in my entire life they were kids from Austin and this movie comes into town and you know I know it was really exciting I finished high school but I finished high school a year early so that I could move out to LA Nikki Cat talked me into moving to LA I think it really messed me up being out there Going to LA was hard. You really have to play the game. You really do. I was never able to do anything as in-depth as Dating Confused. And I also think I just wasn't quite good enough. I didn't work for the whole the whole year I was there. I finally, um, I was living, I had got an apartment in downtown Los Angeles on Rampart, which is a really crappy area. And I got a job way out in Encino doing um, uh, title effects for HBO soft porn. I realized that um, my greatest gifts don't lie, lie in acting. I was much better at working in social service and being a leader in that field. I'm Christine Hosa. I'm the project coordinator for Eyes Wide Open. I believe that this is our world and this is our people and our country and our government and our war. My life is very different now from what it was when I was acting. I'm married and I've got a home, so I'm doing pretty good. 
the film came out in September, and then I was in New York, I saw Parker, and she said she was at a Halloween party, and people, were, someone was playing her. Darla was at a, you know, people were dressed up as her, like, it had already sort of grabbed certain people's, you know, imagination, and I knew that would grow over time. Thank God for video and, uh, and cable, because it became, uh, you know, a cultural icon, despite, you know, despite their, you know, Universal's somewhat shaky attempts to market it. I started to hear things about midnight screenings or it playing, oh, it had been playing in some town for a year or two at midnight for at weekends, just it had built up this, this kind of audience. Watch it once a month. The um, Alamo Draft House had this idea to do an outdoor screening, like kind of like a drive-in movie, and that sort of appealed to me. Out at the Moon Tower, the original location, it sounded just weird enough that I was like, "Yeah, that could be cool." I mean, what the heck, you know? Yeah. Does it feel like a high school reunion for you? It's Parker Posey, right? And that's McConaughey. I really didn't know what to expect from the event. It was really weird walking up. And like, oh, we're driving, and then these cars and these people walking with like, you know, picnic baskets and bedrolls and, you know, things like, God, what's going on out here? Where are these people going? And we finally realized, oh, they're going to the Dazed event. What, who are all these people? It looks like they're going to Woodstock or something. You know, these people walking from far away, traffic everywhere. I'm like, what's, is this really gonna be that big a deal? What, what's going on here? How you doing, yeah. Matthew? What's up, man? Hey, hey what's happening? <laughs> I mean, people had traveled far just to kind of watch this movie with, and with a lot of the cast around. It was, it, so it turned out to be much more, like, I guess, special or unique than I would have thought. I what was most cool about the reunion, it, it wasn't economically motivated. It wasn't for the release of a DVD or anything like that. It had nothing to do with anything other than hey, let's have a party, <laughs> you know, let's all hang out. So it's kind of the spirit of the movie. It was kind of like the same spirit that the kids on the last day of school would go, hey, let's keg her in the woods, you know, let's get something going here. It was that same spirit that kind of brought us all back together again. But like, do you remember there being water here when we shot? No, I thought there was some water here. Where's the water tower? <laughs> It was a gigantic springboard. It was the thing that enabled me to take the risk that I later took. I just wasn't mature enough at the time to appreciate the, the simple value of the experience. And now, in retrospect, I, it's like one of the most important experiences, certainly one of the most important experiences in my professional life, if not the most important in a lot of ways. Having now had several other experiences, it was probably the least miserable of all my experiences. It's like that was it seemed like the start of everybody's lives that was involved in that project. Like it was just such an, a beginning for everybody. Everything seemed so totally positive. Like it was such a score for everybody. It's really great to have been a part of it. It's kind of there are all these obligatory moments that you have to go through, rites of passage, little signposts, but the process is really everything. So I think I'm most happy that. Everyone involved in Days ultimately loved the process of its making, and that was all that really mattered. You know, we didn't have some, we never talked about its results. It was so processed, we weren't, we weren't like, oh, we're making a movie that's going to be a hit, we're making a movie that's going to be this or that. It was just, they were just into their characters, into the moment, you know, which is what the film was. So that was the perfect place. Everything else was kind of not the, not the big picture. Don't you ever feel like everything we do and everything we've been taught is just to service the future? Yeah, I know. It's like it's all preparation. Right. But what are we preparing ourselves for? It's only now, I think, as you get older, you can say, well, this was it, you know? And if you can look back and go, well, that film wasn't just there so I could make other films. That was its own thing. That was, that was it, you know? And in, hopefully you can catch that early enough in life that you go, oh, no, this is it.